there now now it's connected all right good deal all right well we're glad to be here we uh we uh, sorry we had to be gone so for so long but somebody has to take vacation once in a while to represent all of us right <laughs> but we had a really good time uh, two weeks just a little over two weeks was a long time but it was a very uh, fun time we got to see a lot of our country and meet a lot of people from all over the world that's one thing i like about cruises is you meet people from all over the world and uh you have to learn what a few words really mean and you know you try to talk to people and you use your slang and there's no way they're going to understand what you're, you're saying but we'll tell you a little bit more about it we'll bring i've got about seven thousand pictures for you to look at so i'll invite you over to look at my album <laughs> i didn't take quite that many this time but it was fun but it's no place like home amen no place like home has been with your family so uh, we are teaching this series just in case somebody comes to this for the first time on facebook our YouTube, uh, the series called No Penal Substitution. I change it sometimes and I put redefining what we believe, redefining what we believed about the cross, redefining what we believed about God. We would definitely need to redefine uh, what people believe about judgment and punishment and everything else because every time something happens like the hurricanes that's taking place, all of a sudden it's God's judgment. And I haven't read much about it because we didn't have access to internet for quite a while, but I guess the rapture was supposed to take place again. Yesterday. A couple yesterday it's supposed to happen yesterday I don't know where they come up with that but I just encourage you family on the internet don't get wrapped up in that stuff and please don't send those things to me because I'm not interested in it it's just keeping God's people very immature and uh, all of us wanting to leave this planet all the time is the reason it's in the shape that it's in you know if you're if you're not going to take dominion over what belongs to you then you're going to lose it right it's just like uh, I talk about this all the time with homes if you want to own your own home someday then you need to take care of the home that you're renting you know take care of what's been given to you to enjoy well we're, we're not renting this planet it belongs to us it's ours and we we've, we've been taught that it's not we've been taught that our our reward is going to be a nice mansion a trillion jillion light years away and i believed that at one time so i'm not mocking people but you know it's been over two thousand years since jesus said it's finished and it's been over 2,000 years since Jesus told people to look out for some things that were coming in the natural realm, but everybody wants to put it in the future. So we're not that kind of people. So we do need to redefine what we believe because the truth is what we believe has just not been working. Amen? It hasn't. I've never seen anybody that gave offering to the church get back 100 times more than they put in. I've never seen all the promises that the church promised us. You know, you come and get saved and everything's going to be all right. Well. I was born in church and I still had a lot of struggles. Amen? We all did. So all this stuff that they taught us wasn't necessarily true. So we're uh, teaching this series. I'm writing the book uh, that Kay started teaching several years ago, a couple years ago, I guess, titled No Penal Substitution. This is chapter 10. And have you, did, was you here when I passed them out, Lisa, the books? No, I so there's one here for you. Okay. So make sure and take it before you leave. I want to reread Colossians 1.26. Uh, I read it as we closed in our last one a couple of weeks ago. This is session 35 on this teaching. Uh, and of course, it's got a lot of my translation in it. Blair, I translate the scripture back to the original. I'm sure your mom's probably told you, but I don't just read all the King James. I don't have time to translate all of it, so sometimes we still use the King James in. But if I see something that blatantly is mistranslated, then I'm going to translate it and change it. And I think we need to. We need to see what's wrong. And so Colossians 1.26, we're very familiar with Colossians 1.26 and 127. It talks about Christ and you. It talks about a mystery. And people still think that the gospel is a mystery to them. And the reason is because it's been hidden. But it wasn't hidden by God. It was hidden by religion, right? The word religion, and I shared with this a couple of people on the cruise ship, but the word religion means to bind or hold back. So what does it bind and hold you back from? It holds you back from the, the love of God. It holds you back from knowing who you are because it always puts a, a list of things that you have to do to become. And the Bible says those are filthy rags. It says they're dead works. And in the book of Hebrews, it talks about ceasing from dead works. And dead works are anything that you would do to try to be something you already are. You don't need to become better, you already are better. You're what God created to be in the very beginning and God sees you that way. We gotta know that. And it's not just God sees us that way and he's pretending or the way we used to say he looks through Jesus' blood-stained glasses. You ever heard of that? 
I mean, that's not really who we are, but he chooses to see us that way. No, that's really who we are. Just like a parent looks at that child, you may be looking at my grandbaby and seeing a spoiled brat, but I look at I look at Prince Ethan Edward. He's my prince, and I love him so much. And he's a wonderful young man. But there's people that have looked at him because he acts like a three-year-old, which all three-year-olds act that way. They want to start speaking uh, mental diseases over him, and they do that. They call it attention deficit syndrome. They call people autism. They go all kinds of stuff because. They're not seeing who they really are, and they're just acting like a three-year-old. I'm not denying some of those things aren't real, but they're not real as far as God sees things, and they need to become that way ourselves. So uh, the good news is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to talk about that a lot today. But Colossians 1.26 says, Even the mystery of the gospel, which was hidden by man, who receives information from the sense realm. That's what religion is. We receive information from our touch or taste or smell, what it feels like, what it looks like, right? And so receives information from the sense realm from age after age and from generation, but now is retender, uh, rendered apparent to saints. The word saints means uh, uh, holy and sacred themselves. Now the King James took that verse and twisted it around a little bit and made it look like it was only revealed to saints and who declared who a saint was at that time. The Catholic Church, right? There's somebody in Oklahoma that died years ago from Oklahoma that they're getting ready to declare a saint, or they already have. I just heard on the news the other day. But it was all based on what that person did, the life that they lived, and that they worked a miracle. And I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not versed on all the things that make a person a saint, but I'm telling you, that person was a saint when they were born. Because the word saint means holy and sacred. And, you know, my little grandson, when he was born, he was a saint with God and he was a saint with me. And there's not much he's done that can make me not love him. I have laughed at him more than I've gotten upset. I'm never upset with him, but I know they're going to cry. You know, I know they're going to act up and God knows us. And he knows, you know, when there's things that go on in our life, he doesn't see it because he knows that we're just living out of a mistaken identity. One of the greatest things that I learned many, many, many years ago was that God does not see our side slips. God does not see you, you you doing things that the church has told you that you're a sinner. God doesn't see it all. And we're going to talk about that again later on. He sees the end from the beginning. God sees you today the way he created man in the very beginning. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. Then so who sees you other than that? Religion and tradition and you because you believed them. Mm -hmm. And we see ourselves as less than. So the need is for us being the Christ man that needs to render very apparent to us. And I know they use in the Bible a lot Jesus Christ in many places, but it needs to be Christ the new man. It's not the earth walking Jesus that's in you. It's God's spirit. The word Christ is, is literally means the spirit of God. It's your life source. And so you, when you see yourself as Jesus was in his earth walk, as man manifested before they descended from that spirit realm by choice, by a false belief, then you can really, when it renders apparent, to, renders apparent to you, then you can live that way. You will live that way. You will believe it. And I use the example all the time. If you won the lottery and you didn't know it and I came and proved it to you and showed you to you and it rendered very apparent to you, wouldn't it change the way you live? Mm -hmm. uh, it would a lot. So if we can get to people before their body ceases to be able to hold them anymore, before they're wore out by living out of the sense realm, I believe it can change the way they live. And I, can, I believe it will change. It will cause this immortality, uh, mortality to put on immortality. And we will live the life and life abundantly that Jesus came to reveal. And we say, and the King James says he, he came to bring it to us, but he came to bring us to this awareness of life and life more abundantly that we had. It, it, we still we had it. We never lost it. We just lost the awareness of it. And I like what Kay says a lot. She says we forgot who we were. But the truth is, many of us never knew it to forget it. When she's talking about we, she's talking about man, the one man plan, God's one man plan. But uh, first thing we had to do is blame ourselves because we didn't do what Paul told Timothy to do. And that's study to show yourself approved of God. You should have never let some preacher get up and tell you that you're not approved. You should have never sit under any ministry that told you that you were a sinner saved by grace. Never. Well, pastor, that's all we ever heard. Yeah, but you should have studied yourself. 
We all had our Bibles, but more than important, you know, we say, well, yeah, but the Bible's mistranslated. Yes, but deep within that and hidden within that are the mysteries of God that if you did study yourself and say, God, I want the truth, you have an unction with the Holy One. You don't need me per se to tell you what the Holy Spirit would tell you. The Holy Spirit can tell you everything that he tells me, you know. It's, it's just like Lisa here. She said she's been busy. She'd been away for a while, but she's received some tremendous revelation. Did she need me for that? No. You have a union with the Holy Spirit. We, are, we have people that are gifted to do certain things, which I'm gifted in my ministry, and I hopefully that you need that gifting. But you can sit at home and study and listen to the voice of Spirit. That's the key. you got to listen to the voice of Spirit, and you can find out you've always been approved of God. And once you find that out, then you can give that to other people too. So we want these things to render apparent to you so that you will experience these things. But more than that, you experience these things so you can go help other people, not just for me. You know, I would hope if you win the lottery, you're not wanting it just for yourself. You want to share it with your pastor. <laughs> no, share it with others. So, so we know the mystery revealed is the gospel. It's the gospel truth. It's the truthful gospel. Uh, there's places in the Bible I've looked it up and it talks about there is if there's a truthful gospel, then there is an untruthful gospel. And the untruthful gospel is any gospel that says that you have to do anything to please God and that God's not pleased with you. If it teaches that there's internal uh, damnation ahead for everybody that doesn't, quote, get saved, then that is not the truthful gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's a mixture of religion that got put in the word. So anytime we read in the Bible where it says mystery, it's simply referring to the good news of the gospel, the, the good news that was hidden from man because of the descent to carnal knowledge. When you live out of carnal knowledge, what does that produce? It produces death. Paul said to be carnally minded. He didn't say we have a carnal mind. He said to be carnally minded. In other words, if you're constantly uh, thinking on and dwelling on carnal uh, outward realm things, then it's going to produce death. And yes, it will produce physical death, but the death that it produces is cutting yourself off from the knowledge of God, no knowledge of God. Uh, I don't, you know, I had to evict one of my renters the other day and he's got all wrapped up possibly in the heroin. Well, I know nothing about heroin. I, I have no knowledge of heroin whatsoever. I know that they put it in their veins and all that, but I'm, I'm dead to that. I don't need to go to that for peace or whatever it is they go to. There's, they, there, there's things I have no knowledge of whatsoever, so I'm dead to that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There are people in this earth that I don't know, so I'm dead to them. As far as I'm concerned, they don't exist, correct? Mm -hmm. And so when we, we, when we don't have this knowledge, the, the things of God that have been given to us, that pertain to us, we, they don't exist to us. Sandy, when we were being taught by Pastor Garner, we learned a lot of things we never knew before, right? But there were some still some things that were dead to us. I still didn't know that I had an unction with the Holy One and that I know all things. I don't remember him bringing that up and I'm not putting that on to him, but there were a lot of things that he taught me that were good that I had no knowledge of, but there were still much more that were dead to me and so I couldn't live out of that. In 1996, when Father spoke to me, after that tough event that I went through and losing a job and everything, he told me that I would, if I would just trust him and give my life totally over to him, that I would never lack for finances the rest of my life. Well, I had no knowledge of that prior to that. I was always laboring and working and thinking I need to please God. I was always praying, God, send, send Norma in to buy a house full of furniture from me. I didn't even know Norma. I'm just using her name. But I was always asking God to do things. But God began to reveal a part of him to me that I had never known or understood. And that's what scripture says, but Peter wrote it, that I have all things that pertain to life and godliness. And when I accepted that, not even totally understand it, but I said, be it unto me, it changed my life right? So I don't want to be dead to anything that God wants me to know. Do you? I, I want the whole enchilada. I just don't want a part of it. I want all of it. And that's why I say constantly, God, help me in my unbelief. I believe that you did some things. I believe that you can do some things. Just like the man says, yes, I believe that you can heal my son. But he was very wise. And he said, help me in the area that I don't believe because I want all of it, not just a healing. You know, some of us need healing, right? In our bodies, we have some things. So yes, I want healing, but I want the whole enchilada. I want to know that God is my health. 
Therefore, when something comes against me, I can begin to speak against that and say, no weapon formed against me can prosper, not just because I'm quoting that scripture, but because God is my health. I have the spirit of God in me, and in the spirit of God, there is no sickness and disease, and nothing can hinder the spirit of God. So how do I, how does that happen? I learn more and more that I'm spirit, and by faith, every day I live a spirit. I do not live as carnal anymore. Correct? I'm not asking my wife because she lives with me and sometimes she sees that, <laughs> but it's not who I am. So the good news that was hidden from man uh, is it, it's really, it's the, uh, it's everything that happened in Jesus's virginal birth all the way to Christ, the new man, uh, been raised up in position of understanding at rest with God. I mean, when you found out that God was, uh, not mad at you when you found out that you're one with God? Is that, does that not bring great rest? And that's what seated with means. It's at rest with God. I am no longer worried about God's going to get me. God's going to punish me. When I die, I may not make it. All the stuff that I worried about because of religious teaching, you know what? I'm at rest with God and nobody can get me out of my seat. Amen? Amen. And that's what I was telling one of our sisters today. That she got some stress because of her job and I just... My, my only thing I can say to her is don't get out of your peace. Stay in peace, you know, whatever it is. And we all have jobs where there's pressure. We all have situations in life where, there, where there's pressure in our life. One of mine is I worry about one of my uh, kids a little too much sometimes, but I'm not going to let it get me out of my peace because I know it's going to work out. It will. And I listen to wisdom there. So Paul was not writing about a person getting saved, uh, receiving understanding at that point. You know, a lot of times we thought, well, when we got saved, then we received all this. No. And see, I, w I, w I wondered that most of my life, but I never questioned it. But I just wonder how in the world can somebody walking down an aisle, taking a preacher's hand and saying a sinner's prayer, all of a sudden, everything you ever did is gone. And all of a sudden, everything becomes new and you know everything and all knowledge comes to you. And it's just, it didn't make sense because it didn't happen. You didn't get saved when you prayed the sinner's prayer that the church came up with. Uh, and I'm going to tell you in the true meaning of the word saved later on when we get there, but that happened from before the foundation of the world. Everything God did was in God before the very foundation of the world. Amen? There's never a thing that you did to get anything. You were born with it already. And I know that rocks a lot of people in the world. It doesn't us, and I hope it's not yours, because I know your mom's probably shared with you a lot, and you may have known it already, but... Uh, people experience the truthful gospel and one's identity uh, in different ways changes. Some people, it happens real quick. Some people, it's a, over a progression of time. I always go back to Barbara Ward when we first started meeting Brother Garner. Uh, she struggled with what he taught, and she didn't come regularly. She was going to another church, but she would come because she knew most of us. And it just, it was, it was a little real hard for her. But one day Judy wrote a song on, uh, he pierced my ear by the post of the door and, and uh, quite a few words in there began to get her. And she was standing, sitting in the chair and all of a sudden she just began to weep and, and it, it got hold of her. She didn't get the gospel, the gospel got hold of her. And so some people it's instantaneously, some people it takes some time. And so it's not just cause you say a prayer and all of a sudden it's all there. I wish that was that easy. <laughs> You know, and to, to, to understand all this, but I go back to study the show thyself approved. But we're not doing these things to make it become soul. And that's probably one of our greatest struggles is we, we, we still look with a scene of the natural eye and we don't see ourselves what we want ourselves to be. We don't see millions of dollars in the bank. We still don't see our bodies renewed. We still feel 86. We still feel. 67 we still feel you know all those things and so there is that tendency to still study to get this to to try to make this take place in our life and we've all talked about that for several years but the truth is we're not doing that we're studying to learn that we already are we're studying to help other people not just myself i'm not doing these things for a better humanhood i'm doing these things because i want to go out and help other people grow with me as i grow and we all grow together so Literally, the word saint means holy and sacred ones. It means they are sacred to God. And these, these most, these, this mystery is it's a sacred thing to God. And he reveals them to all his sacred people who will come, who want to hear it. God's always speaking. You know, whether you come or not, he's always speaking. His voice never stops. Why? Because he's in you. 
the, the very voice of God speaks all the time. People who have never, quote, gotten saved have heard God talk, haven't they? I've, I've heard many people say I was drowned down the street and I heard God speak to me. And they heard through their perception, but they heard God. And I always taught until you get saved, you can never hear God. You ever, was you ever taught that until you get saved, God doesn't hear your prayers? You ever heard that before? All the time it's taught. It's not true. It's not true. So uh, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 14, and I read this several years ago, where it said many are called but few are chosen and that didn't match up what I understood about what Jesus did so of course I look it up and the word many uh, it says is the largest number they had no words in the Greek to actually say million trillion billion whatever it means the largest number so it says all then right and the word called means saint holy consecrated so uh, everyone everyone ever born ever will be born on planet earth are saints and are sacred and are holy. So it says all are saints, but few choose, or few are chosen. The word should have been choose. Few choose to live that life because they don't know they're holy. Just like if you didn't know that you're rich and you see yourself as poor, how are you gonna live? Poor, right? Always trying to get some a better job, a better raise, or whatever it is. And that's that's a tough life. And how do I know that? Because I lived that way most of my life up until about 96 and even during that time period for several years I still live struggling trying to get trying to be better trying to do better and uh, you know so the reason we don't live holy is because we don't know that we're holy the reason we don't live as a sacred vessel is because we don't know that we're a sacred vessel so there again that's what we're helping people with so God so loved the world it didn't say he so loved the church in John 3 16 it said God so loved the world right and I thought it was God loved the church and everybody else he was going to damn for eternity. And that's the way they teach it today. Yep. Yeah, but it says God so loved the world. And you know what? You can look at the world and it doesn't say the church. It doesn't say religion. It says the world and the inhabitants thereof, everybody. So in Colossians 1.28, the Apostle Paul is explaining the, the good news was hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to sacred ones. And the mystery is Christ in you. The hope of glory and there again that's not jesus that's christ that's your spirit you can say jesus christ if you want to but we again we need to do some more teaching on god's one man plan because people don't quite understand that and identification brother garner taught us that identification and how jesus identified with humanity and he did become humanity on the cross to reveal the love of god but it was one god's one man plan so we need to understand that christ is in me and the word Christ in Colossians 1.27, when you get down to the root word to it, it means it translates to furnish that which is required daily. So your spirit furnishes everything that's required daily, spiritually and physically. My spirit is what keeps my heart pumping. My spirit is what keeps my lungs going. My spirit com uh, commands my brain to do what it's called to do, and it keeps it going. And then my spirit, if I listen to the voice of spirit, my spirit can give me wisdom and knowledge and understanding how to deal in the physical part of this life, how to deal with people, how to do things. My spirit can say, you know what, you're trying to put this motorcycle together. That time I got stranded out in the wilderness once. My spirit can say, and just let me see, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, and fix it so I can get out. And it happened in my life. And I didn't know it. I had no knowledge in my natural brain to do that. But I have the mind of Christ. And it's not just for spiritual things. It's how to live in this earth. It's called the voice of wisdom and the voice of knowledge. And so what was forgotten was that all mankind is in Christ. And whether they're dead in Christ. Years ago I used to come up with this. Well, there are people who are dead in Christ. There are people who are alive in Christ. And there are people who are asleep in Christ. And uh, it talks about in the, the, what they call the rapture scripture where, you know, where the, the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which remain will forbear, forever be with the Lord, not the Lord, but with the Lord. It's like a mother with child. In other words, we will forever know that we're one with God. But the dead in Christ were people who had no knowledge yet. We were that, were we not? Most of our life we were dead in Christ. I had no clue what that meant to me. And so either way, uh, we're, they're, they're, we're all holy. And, see, and that's the gospel of inclusion that people are upset with. A lot of finished work people that are still called finished work and even grace sometimes. Some of the grace teachers will teach grace, the grace of God. They're like, 
Kathy said, but then they add their buts to it. You know, God loves you, but, you know, but it, inclusion means everybody's included in God's love. Not just in what Jesus did. Jesus came to reveal something, and he revealed that to everybody, not just Christians. You realize when Jesus did his work, there were no such things really as Christians. When Jesus came, there were Jews. There were Gentiles. Gentiles are people who were not Jews. There were heathens, if you would, other kinds of, but, but there were no Christians when Jesus came and walked among men. And so they, they use the word Christian as followers of Christ, but the truth is we didn't follow Christ. Man didn't follow Christ their life. They followed a, a system and an order and they followed religion and they followed, followed men's opinions. And they wasn't following what Jesus did because they couldn't hear Jesus at that time. Jesus said, I've been here, I've been trying to share these things to you, but you can't hold them, you can't bear them, they keep slipping from your hands. But be a good cheer, I'm not going to send you teacherless, leave you teacherless, I'm going to send many more teachers, and they're going to explain you and guide you into the things of me. A lot of people are afraid to say that, but I'm not, because that's what it really was. He didn't say I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you, because they already had the Holy Spirit. Did they not? There's only one Holy Spirit. You can't get the Holy Spirit. I have friends that, uh, you know, I was raised in a church that we talked in tongues and we'd get up and give testimony, especially when I was a young man. Thank God that I'm saved, spirit, uh, filled with the Holy Ghost and sanctified. I think that's what we said all the time. And so most of my life, I was taught that you had to get the Holy Spirit. And that was the pretty much the height of everything. And of course, the evidence was talking in tongues, but it's not true. We didn't have to get anything. We already had the Holy Spirit when we were born. Is that hard for anybody? <laughs> it, 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 but it is a struggle for people. And so we needed to wake up to the fact that we are Holy Spirit. We, we are Holy Spirit. God is Spirit. And we have God's Spirit. So we are Holy Spirit. And so when I, I don't say the Holy Spirit when I write anymore. I say my Holy Spirit. My Holy Spirit spoke this to me because I possess it. It's not God's Holy Spirit. And, you know, the proof in that is all the songs we wrote about come down Holy Spirit. You know, we were always trying to get the Holy Spirit to come. And then we always talked about how the Holy Spirit left the place because they wasn't doing right. Well, if that's true, then all the people left out of there. And then there was no Holy Spirit left in the building. <laughs> I know I've been silly, but I like to give silly pictures because you'll never forget them. <laughs> What's the difference in asleep in Christ? And all asleep in Christ is the dead in Christ has no knowledge whatsoever, whatsoever. And then asleep in Christ are uh, people who, uh, it could be people that had, our bodies had, their bodies had died, you know, and, but I don't think that's what it is. I've heard people teach that. I think it's just, they know a little bit who they are, but they're not functional. They're not living out of it. And I may be wrong there, but I think that's what there's alive in Christ are people who become fully aware and they are, they are beginning and are living out of who they are. And that's that to me that's what that is but asleep is you're there but you're just you've been put to sleep by a religion and tradition and uh, the cares of the world and all that dead in Christ are people who have no idea who they are at all but they're all everybody's gonna wake up to that okay so uh, what was for, for what was forgot was that all mankind is in Christ that's what was forgot by man as a whole. And I don't know, that happened a long time ago. So it, not, it matters not how a person acts. It, uh, you, she, they're still in Christ. It doesn't matter what they do. They're still in Christ. Now, are we for people going out and doing bad things? You know, what we call evil? No, we're not for that. But we still have to see them from the end to the beginning. In other words, we've got to still see them that they're, 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 they're righteous and they're holy and they're God's child and pray over them. And that's hard, especially when they've done something that affects your family or you, you know, but there can come a point in time when we say, you know, I'm sorry they did that. I'm sorry they acted that way. That's not who they are before we really know that because who, who does that help? It helps you, but it also helps them. That you can free them from it. Do I say you have to go immediately and forgive them for doing something to your child? Or no, you don't have to say that. But you can say to yourself, I know that they're living out of a mistaken identity. And I don't have to have a relationship with them. 
I don't have to hang around them, you know? I don't have to do a lot of things people think they have to do. You can love them from afar if you have to, depending on what they've done, but you can release them and say they're still righteous, they're still holy. And again, I know people will be writing me on that. They struggle with it, and I understand that. You know, I've heard people say, well, what if somebody did something to your granddaughter? I would be very angry. I'd be very upset with them. But I also am mature enough to know that that's their function out of a false identity. I'm not going to condemn them to hell. They're already in hell. That's where I'm getting. I'm not going to say they're wretched sinners and they should burn in hell. I had an uncle come to me because of some of the stuff my dad did in his early life and condemned him to hell right at his funeral. And it was, I mean, at my cousin's funeral and told me my, my daddy was burning in hell right then. Where did that come from? It came from religion and tradition. He was in hell. That's what caused him to do the things that he did, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And you know what? I've been in hell in my life because I've done some things that doesn't represent or picture, you know, who I should be. All of us have, have we not? But I'm still redeemed. I'm still holy. I'm still righteous. So this is the gospel of inclusion. And when we begin, uh, when we began, people, we, we see people holy. We began holy. Then something will begin to work on the inside of us and we will begin to see with other people that they're holy and they're righteous, you know, and then we quit bad mouthing our leaders. You know, we, we, it was, you know, we had a president for eight years prior to Donald Trump and half the country couldn't stand him. Half of the country spoke evil of him, you know, didn't see him as a righteous and holy person, didn't speak righteous and holy things over him. And now we have another president that the other side likes and so another half of the world speaks evil over them. You know, so how are we ever going to get anything done? How are we ever going to pray over our leaders if, if we, we will only pray for them if they fit what I believe? But what we do is we pray the word over them. We don't say, God, drag them to a knot hole backwards. We don't say, God, give them an early death. I've heard people use scripture to say that, <laughs> right? But we, we speak wisdom and knowledge over them. We speak that they will begin to listen to the voice of the Spirit. We speak that in their night dreams that they'll hear God speak to them. That's what we're supposed to speak. And I still speak that over Donald Trump. I know he has some crazy things he says. And some people, you know, can't take it. But that's why he was elected. You know, people wanted somebody to get up and stand up against some things. But we still must pray over him. God help him make righteous decisions. I don't, all of them. I don't want him to still function out of the power of a carnal mind. I want him to function out of his spirit. And he has a spirit just like everybody else does. So there again, how one acts has nothing to do with who he or she is. It will affect your experience, though. There will be consequences to how you act, but it doesn't affect who you are. It hinders other people seeing who you are, though. Correct? So it doesn't give us, quote, what they call a license just to go out and do what you want, because if you do and you're functioning out of a carnal mind, then you're going to cause a lot of problems. You're going to cause a lot of uh, confusion. So when we see and treat people as who they really are, we will help them begin to awaken. You know, I used to tell women a long time ago when Don and I taught marriage awareness classes and they would come to me and you know, say, well, my husband's this way and he's not a believer and blah, blah, blah. You know, what do I do? What do I do? Always praying that he'd get saved and beating him up. You know, when are you going to come to church? I said, why don't you treat him like he already is? Why don't you start treating him like he already is or her, if it's your wife? Why don't you, when you're reading scripture, go to him and say, honey, I'm trying to figure out what this means and I can't quite get it. Can you look at it and see what you think instead of treating them the way you see them? And that's what we've done most of our lives, that we've treated people the way we see them. I think many of divorces could have been stopped if young or any couple would have learned that and begin to treat your spouse as to who they are, not who they're manifesting themselves to be. Don't you think so? So what if we do that to the entire world? Bless you. What if we do that to the entire world? Treat our neighbors that way. Treat everybody as they're righteous and they're holy and all that. You know, I was... I had a chance to do that and I failed uh, while I was in New York. I got out of the taxi and I looked down, there was a hundred dollar bill laying right there on the road, flat out. And I said, well, Lord, what? you know, so I walked up and I put my foot on it to keep it from blowing away and I bit, picked it up. And then the taxi driver, he saw at the same time and he was heading for it. And I just put it in my pocket. <laughs> what would you done, Sandy? <laughs> She's shaking her head no at me. 
<laughs> she, she said she had took it and run. But it had been nice just to hand it to him. But I ended up giving it away to somebody else later on. But still, I, I just I really want to treat people yeah. like they're sacred and they're holy. That means I'm going to prefer them over me. I'm going to prefer them over me. And I'm, I'm, uh, I just want to, we're here to bless people. Remember Brother Garner taught a lot about the trumpet of the Lord and the seventh trumpet, you know, and Judy wrote that song, the seventh trumpet is sounding. It's still sounding. It was sounding through Brother Garner. It was sounding through ministers before Brother Garner. Leon Stump was one of the first ones that really taught on the Pauline revelation. It was sounding through him. But, you know, they had a measure of the truth. Leon told me himself that he gave it all up because somebody died in his church. Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't tell us nobody's ever going to die physically, does it? No. You know, and so we get where we major on those kinds of things. But the trumpet that is, is getting greater and greater and greater. It started with me in 1988. And I'm telling you, it's, it's gotten greater and greater. It's always sounding, and it's always the same sound, but our ability to hear it and understand gets clearer and clearer and clearer. We're beginning to tune into that frequency. There are sounds in this room right now. Did you know it? And if you tuned into them, you could hear them. Uh, there are frequencies that we just kind of get used to sometimes. You know, Don and I in our house, we can go to bed at night and there are sounds that are going on in there that we don't hear. But Sandy, if you and Rod came and spent the night in our house, you'd be hearing the ice maker, you'd be hearing the hum of the refrigerator, you'd be, because you're not used to those things. Well, see, I don't want to get used to the voice of God, do you? I don't want to get to where it literally I filter it out. And that's what we've done is we've filtered God's voice out because we've been hearing the voices of the systems of the world. We, we pay more attention to Fox News and CNN News and all those other things. And we're not listening to the voice of God. Yeah. And so when we focus on that, it doesn't bring us any peace at all. Nothing brings us peace but the voice of God within inside of us. So I want to fine tune into that. It's just like KOMA radio stations blasting through you right now, you know. So if you had an instrument that man created, you could tune that in and we could be listening to KOMA radio and dancing and rocking and rolling to all those sounds we used to listen to, you know. But I want to tune in to that, seven, that seventh trump. The seventh trump is the one that says it's finished, it's completed. Yeah. You know, I, Jesus came to reveal who we are. He didn't come to fix who we were. He didn't come to do something like we were taught, Rod. He didn't come to do something about what was wrong with us. He came to reveal the love of God to us. Mm -hmm. That's a greater revelation to me. That tells me that I never was in need of salvation. I was already saved. I just didn't know it. So we had it backwards thinking that if we see the Bible talks about uh, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you know, and live by the spirit. So we wanted to live by the Spirit, so what we did is we practiced not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. We because because we, we thought because we didn't do these things, we were spiritual, right? Well, it was backwards. We're to live spiritual, and you won't do that. Draw from your spirit. See, we used to talk about how people, wow, these people are really spiritually mature, and it was based on what they did, how they prayed how they gave words of knowledge. I remember Judy Vandenberg used to tell me about a woman that was a real spiritual giant. We all love her, but it was based on how she could give words of knowledge, how she could interpret dreams. It was all about the do to be, but she was already spiritual. And the good news, Judy, if you're listening, you were a spiritual giant. We've always been spiritual, right? We're not little bitty baby spirits. We're full grown. We have all knowledge and all everything that we need. So all the events of Jesus Christ was only revealed something that was always true of us. This will get rid of people thinking uh, that we're not forgiven enough. I've never thought of it that way, but I've evidently I believe that I wasn't forgiven enough because I was always seeking more forgiveness. Am I right? I was always trying to figure out something I needed to do to be, you know, what can I do, God? You know, uh, and so this will get rid of this. This will bring peace. This will bring, bring rest no matter what's going on in my life today at all. And I believe it will bring protection that will keep me from getting involved in things that will hinder me that the Bible calls producing effects, which that's what the word devil means. It means produce or hinder. It's an action. It's not a noun. It's an action. There are things that we do that really hinder us and we feel guilty about it. 
You know, I went on the cruise ship. Don and I are doing our best with the help of God to get rid of sugar in our lives and, and bread and potatoes, the things that turn into sugar. We have concluded and discovered that sugar is what causes a lot of problems. It strips our arteries, which grabs hold of cholesterol. There's nothing wrong with cholesterol, but our arteries get stripped with sugar and then it grabs hold of cholesterol and builds it up. And we figured that all out. So we've been on it for several months. And then when we went on the cruise, we were really kind of sin conscious, if you would, you know, like I can't have this ice cream. I can't have this pie. And there was cream cheese, I mean, uh, cheesecake and all kinds of stuff. And I was just really trying to keep from doing that. And I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't try to, but there was that consciousness there to always be careful because, you know, and, um, uh, it was her birthday, so we had some ice cream and a little cake. And a couple times before that, I had one ice cream cone, and I had some other stuff. And I, and then all of a sudden, this thought started coming to me: Man, you're going to gain 10 pounds before you get back. And I, you know, I did. I wasn't going to, but I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And and I relate that to the things we do in the world that thinks we think that it ho that that we're hindering God's love for us, or that we're doing something wrong. And it's always hollering at you, right? But I got home, I didn't gain any weight. You know, I'd gone up two pounds and it was gone the next day. Donna lost five pounds, you know. But there, and I thought, why were, why was I fearing for? Can I not trust the wisdom of God in me? You know, can I not trust that, you know, if I eat one ice cream in two weeks, it's not going to kill me? You know, and so I'm just showing you that picture because I was just constantly thinking about it all the time instead of just being. Just relax and let the voice of wisdom say what you should pick and what you shouldn't pick. And and so we want to walk through this earth without this sin consciousness all the time that we're doing something to hinder us from God. There's nothing, Paul said, and Paul was given the pure revelation, there's nothing can separate you from the love of God. Not one thing. And then later on when Jesus was talking about the marriage covenant, which was a picture to us, let no man put asunder that which God has joined together. And that's not talking about a husband and wife. In fact, you know, it should be. But that was talking about you and God. And Lord of mercy, how many preachers have got up and put asunder of that? That you're oneness with God because you've done something that separates you from God. God's going to get you. You don't give enough money. You know, you don't serve enough. The list goes on and on and on. God only, we, we, we need to realize this, that he, he doesn't behold carnal actions whatsoever. Wouldn't that bring a lot of peace to, to people just to realize God does not behold that? God's eyes are holy and he sees what he created. He looks at you, Wanda, and all he's ever seen is what he created. He created an altogether, altogether lovely woman. He created what he created man to be in the beginning. That's how he sees us today. You know, what about, I think it's in Hebrews, but God called, uh, uh, when Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and I believe he did, he called uh, Lot righteous. Mm -hmm. What? What do you mean righteous? Mm -hmm. He produced children through his daughters. He got drunk. He did all, you know, and you say he's righteous. And then he said that Abraham was faithful. Now, in our estimation, was Abraham faithful? He didn't trust God, according to what we would see. He listened to Sarah's good idea and had sex with her uh, servant and produced a child that wasn't the, the child that God wanted produced. But see, God does not see those things. Oh, well, good, I could do everything I want to. Yeah, you can. Paul said not all things are uh, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Yeah, you can you can go do drugs, but it's not expedient. There's going to be consequences. You can have an affair if you want to, but there's going to be consequences. I'm, all the stuff that people want to do, and I hear people say all the time, well, you know, we can do anything we want. We're fine. God loves us. Yeah, if you want to wait till you die and find out and suffer the consequences and see all the stuff that this world's been going through is consequences. It's not judgment. Whose fault is it because there's out of order hurricanes today? It's man, right? Whose fault is it because there's earthquakes and all the? It's man. It's not because man's using plastic and man's polluting the atmosphere. It's because man is not functioning out of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. I believe if we would function out of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, we can 
uh, have fuel that's not going to hurt our atmosphere. We can, God can drop in all kinds of knowledge and understanding how to, to do things. And a lot of stuff we'll find out is we don't need a lot of this stuff that we've come up with. Correct? One of them is medicine. Medicine's killing us. You know what it is? It's antichrist. It's antichrist your life. If we have all things that pertain to life and godliness and God is our health, and I'm not getting on to you for taking anything. You know, I take niacin, I take an aspirin. I'm weaning myself off my blood pressure medicine. I'm almost at the point where I don't even need it at all anymore. Thank God, you know, because I'm off of sugar. But I'm, I'm just telling you that we can find out that there's, there's, there's natural herbs that don't cause side effects. That God has in this planet enough seeds of the field to keep us living if we would just figure out how to do it. Amen? Let's go to 2 Timothy 1.9. I'm almost done. This is my first close. It's just quarter tail. Y'all know this is go out to eat Sunday, right? Hope you're all going to go. You plan on it? <laughs> all right. 2 Timothy 1.9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now, does that say who's going to save us? See, Timothy... Timothy wrote this a long, long time ago before you were born. And he says, who hath saved us? That's past tense, correct? Mm -hmm. And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Right there's a proof scripture for you if you want it. It was, it was done. And see, it says, not according to our works. The church taught us according to your works. The Catholic religion taught us according to your works. Uh, uh, every religion, Christianity, uh, Islam, uh, Buddhism, all of it, it's according to your works. You're always trying to do something. And uh, this says that it's not according to your works. So he has saved this as past tense, not when you say a sinner's prayer, not when you do something that the religion wants you to. To do So he's saying the gospel has nothing to do with the response of man's uh, failure or what I like to say, the descent. It's not something to undo what Adam did. And see, that's what I taught for a long time. Jesus undid what Adam did. Correct? He didn't undo it. He destroyed it. <laughs> he destroyed the effects of it. But see, what Adam did did not make man not righteous. What Adam did is move man into the realm of ignorance, right. into the dust realm, and cutting themselves off from cutting themselves off from drawing from their life source. They still had the life source in them, mm -hmm. but it went dormant, and they didn't know how to draw from it. That's why I also believe that after people were added to the church, the disciples went to them. And they didn't say, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? They said, have you received of your Holy Spirit since you believe? There's a big difference. Because we were taught that they went around saying, have you received the Holy Spirit? They laid hands on, they started talking in tongues. No, he said, have you received of your spirit? They said, we never knew there were such, these, such things like this. And they began to teach them that your spirit now. Now start living on your spirit. And you know that's true because all of Paul's writing, writings are teaching us, don't be currently minded anymore. This is who you, you were acting like. This is who you were living like. But this is who you really are. And Jesus came to reveal these things to you. Why do you think he revealed this to Paul? So Paul can tell us that the gospel was to reveal a truth to us, not to fix us. We were always righteous. We were always holy. Man never lost the spirit of God. So did God's purpose change because of what man did? Absolutely not. Not at all. From the very, God's purpose, his nature was to pursue us from everlasting to everlasting for eternity. God's always pursuing people. The word wrath means love. It's not something bad. He loves us. He's passionately longing toward us. It comes from orge, which is the same word where they get orgasm from. It's, a, it's one of the highest awesome feelings you can have. And God has that feeling towards man. Isn't that awesome? Even when you're in a gutter, even when you're in the worst state you can be in, God desires man. And he pictured that over and over in the Old Testament. 
We were given the revelation at the passion of Jesus, and the revelation was his grace. That was the revelation. Verse 10 says, but it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So what God did, and that salvation, the way God created us, is made manifest now by the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, he came to reveal all that was always true of us. Yes. Always. And it says, who hath abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light. See, it says to light. Mm -hmm. He didn't bring it then. He didn't bring life and life more abundantly then. He brought it to light, to understanding through the gospel, through the death, the burial, the resurrection, crucified, died, very quick and raised and seated. Every one of those steps were not to change us. They were to wake us up to who we are and to reveal that to us. His saving was not the result of a failure or responding to a failure. He did so according to his own purpose from before the foundation of the world. So what have we been taught saved means? I come and I get saved. Why? So I can go to heaven and not go to hell, right? Well, I'd like to ask anybody, I would love for anybody to come to me and tell me the day that they got saved, like the church said, that they never had another problem the rest of their life. They never sinned after that, what the church calls sin. Rod, did you? It's testimony time. It's, it's, you know, did you ever do what the church said was sin after you got saved? Sure. sure you did. We all did. We all lied. We all cheated. We all did things. We all lusted. You know, There's not a man alive that hasn't looked at a woman and lusted. Right? Confess it to your mother right now. <laughs> so, teach you to come be the visitor. <laughs> so save is not what we thought it was. It's not something we came to get. It's not something that happened to you. And I know when my wife came down and accepted the gift of salvation and what the church called got saved, she had a tremendous, tremendous experience. But you want me to tell you what it is? It was a release, mm -hmm. a release of all the condemnation and an experience of peace that she never had before. Is that not right, Donna? Mm -hmm. That's right. But it wasn't. It wasn't an undoing. It wasn't an undoing of the bad person she was. It was a release that took place. An awareness took place. Yeah. yeah. Yes. An experience of it. But how can you experience God's love if you always feel guilty and you feel like you're doing something wrong? When she lost her brother, lost her sister, both died in tragic deaths, and she went to her mom and dad and said, why is God doing this to us? If you believe that, how can you experience the love of God? That we've done something wrong. God must not love us or my brother or sister wouldn't have died. How many people base God's love on what happened? You didn't save my husband. You didn't save my wife. You know, I lost my job. I gave my tithe and I still lost my job. See, it's, it's robbed us of, the, of, of understanding. The word saved is sozo. It comes from the Greek word 4982, S-O-Z-O, or sodezo, S-O-D-E-Z-O. It mean, it, the meaning is to live safe, live protected. Donna, can I borrow your pen real quick? I need to change something on my notes, and I don't want to forget. I'm going to give it right back to you, so just stay right here. Okay. The, the word safe, it means to live safe. It means to uh, live protected. It means to live in divine health. It means to do well, and it means to, to be whole. It's not something that becomes, it's be. It's be, and we were created that way already. And that's why uh, Brother Garner always said, be who you be. It's not something you want to, you need to become. You don't need to get saved. You don't need God to save you. You don't need God to save you out of circumstances of life or consequences. You need to realize that you already are safe. And you need to turn to the voice of wisdom that will help you live that way. As we learned about Jehovah Rapha, our healer, we discovered that it's not Jehovah Rapha, our healer. It's Jehovah Rapha, our health. So if I'm always asking God to heal me when he's my health, then that's anti-Christ my life. I think that God's got to do something so I can get well. No, all I have to do is by faith is make a withdrawal on that and just say, you're my health. You know, I don't have to pray to my heart to bring oxygen to me or my lung, do I? 
You know, we just, we believe it. We, we know, I, I'm not one time in my life thought about, okay, heart, you need to beat a little faster, a little slower. I never thought one time in my life, okay, lungs, you need to, you need to pump, right? I've never thought about, now there have been times I wish my digestive system would work a little better, <laughs> but I never could command it to, right? It, it just happens. Why? Because the very spirit of God, who is our life, keeps our vital organs functioning, you know, then, but we hinder that by what we bring into ourselves, what we think about ourselves. A fear hinders life tremendously, right? Worry, stress brings all kinds of stuff on us, and it traduces the life of God in us that is there to keep us alive and keep us strong and, and keep us holy. And I believe live a long, long, long time. I, I don't mean, didn't mean to say word keep us holy, keep us whole, functioning properly. So live safe, protected, divine health. Yeah, live safe, live protected, live in divine health, do well, and be whole. And that happened before the foundation of the world. That's how God created man. Do, do, do we think that God created Adam with disease in him? No. Or all, this, all the false character and nature that came out of them forgetting who they were? No. God cre created them safe. Yes. Right? God created them whole. God created them with peace. God created them with, and said that every, this whole earth is yours. You're the prince of the earth. They were the prince of the earth, not some devil out there. They were the prince of the earth. Man, you are the prince of the earth today. And so we need to start living the way God created us and by faith speak that and I am whole. And I can do all things through Christ. The Christ in my, not, I'm not trying to get Jesus out there somewhere to strengthen me. It's the spirit of God in me strengthens me to do that. But if I say I can't, then I hinder it. As a man thinketh in his conscious awareness, so is his realization. Not so is he, so is his realization. And your realization becomes very powerful because then it becomes your imagination. You have bad things go at work, your computer crashes, and you, you know, you've lost all your files or whatever, and it, all of a sudden your imagination thinks, oh my God, it's all over with. We've lost everything. You know, I'm going to get fired. You know, all kinds of stuff begins to take place, and next thing you know, it becomes a realization. And my example was when I was managing Hoffman's Furniture in Moore, Oklahoma, uh, I begin to hear some things and my imagination began to tell me that my boss didn't like me. They were upset with me and blah, blah, blah. So next thing you know, I called a meeting with them. They didn't call a meeting. I did. And I said, I know y'all aren't happy with me and I forget all the stuff that I said. And pretty much they said, well, you're right. We're, we'll just let, we're going to let you go. And after two months working at, back at Mathis Brothers Furniture, hating what I was doing, I, I, quit being the prodigal, if you would. I dusted myself off and I went back to see him. I said, I'm very sorry. That was my fear. I know that you never said anything uh, about this at all. Please, may I have my job back? And they said, yes. Wasn't that a powerful lesson I should have learned? <laughs> and that's, that's what we do in our own lives. And fear brings all these things on us. And it's not true. It's not ours. So Jesus came, appeared on the scene. The gospel was not brought to man, the gospel was brought for man. Jesus came to reveal which was what that which was always true yes. before the foundation of the world. He came to reveal that man was righteous in, in their creation. Mm -hmm. Man has always been righteous because man is of God. So there's a disclosure taking place right now to people who are awake to truth and who are awakening to truth. And we believe there's so many out there, it's unbelievable, who are beginning to wake up. Mm -hmm. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18. Can you give me just a few more minutes? Second closing. Since we missed two services. Okay. So. <laughs> What'd you say? Are y'all you all right? First Not Peter too much. Peter. First Peter 1 18. <clears throat> For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, you know, we could say with authoring and the tithe and all that stuff from your vain conversations. And I like Kay pointed out that the new King James version says, aimless conduct through your aimless conduct. That's filthy rags, right? Dead works mm -hmm. received by tradition from your fathers. See, that's where we got most of the stuff we believe is if it's good enough for dad, if it's good enough for grandpa, it's good enough for me. Correct. Mm -hmm. So we received all that from them. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 20, 
who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So it was all true before the foundation of the world, but it's manifested for you Amen. and for us. So if we're not careful, we read these verses and get the idea that humanity received some feudal wave from their forefathers and God responded to that by killing his son. We were taught that, that God killing his son was a way of uh, undoing what we had become and who we were. And there again, that was uh, paganistic ideas that crept into religiosity. That was myth mythological beliefs that came from people around Israel. And even to the day, there's all kinds of mythological beliefs in the church mm -hmm. and all other religions too. The revelation of Jesus Christ as the controlling factor of incarnation, not what man did. That makes sense? That's the controlling factor, so we need to understand that. And Jesus, uh, on the cross, had a crown of thorns placed on his head, or as he was going to the cross, and by the time he got there, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, that was a revealing to us, because Jesus became the federal head human, right? Mm -hmm. See, there again, a lot of people don't know about federal head, God's one-man plan. Jesus was there as all humanity in that passion, and he was revealing to people that I'm burying your confusion. You're confused because anything that goes around your head is a, is a mentality. It's a covenantial understanding. The woman in the book of Revelation with a crown of 12 stars, she, it's a covenantal understanding of crucified, died very quick and raised and seated and what that meant to mankind. So it was revealing that Jesus was doing something to do away with man's confusion. And he became that. And what did he do? In his death, he destroyed it. Destroyed is cardigeo, it means melted away, made void, brought to naught, non-existence, and he destroyed that degenerate nature activity that man had allowed into them, right? He destroyed that. He also stopped the sacrificial system. He was there to tell people that if you want to sacrifice, and that's what he told Abraham, you know, if you want to sacrifice, because Abraham still went out and got him a ram when he wasn't supposed to, he said, I'll become the land. The, the angel of the Lord said, God will provide himself the lamb. It didn't say a lamb, it said the lamb. And man still didn't get it. And we've still been over 2,000 years trying to sacrifice to God, our time, our talent. I used to be really good at teaching to give your time, your talent, your treasure. I mean, I'm a pastor, I'm supposed to do that. We need your time to build this church. We need your, 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 your talent. We need you to be piano players. We need you to do this, we need you to do that. And we need your treasure, we need your money. So it was all, you know, teaching people to give, to give, to give, to please God. And it wasn't. It was to please the pastor. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> oh, mercy. So he identified with that, and he showed us that we were never separate from God. God never turned his back on Jesus, ever. Never did. Hebrews 4.3. For we which have believed do enter. See, they were in it, but this is talking about entering understanding. Mm -hmm. If you believe, you enter into it. Just like I was saying, if you believe you won the lottery, then you're going to enter into that lifestyle. And hopefully it will be controlled by wisdom and knowledge and righteousness and not going crazy, right? So for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I've sworn in my wrath, and there again, the word wrath means love or longing desire. It's not a bad thing. I, in, in my love, I, I've sworn in my love, if they will enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. So in other words, enter into what I did in the beginning, not what I did 2,000 years ago. I know this is really a big thing. It's a big thing for me because I've majored on the Pauline revelation, being crucified, died, buried, crucified, died, buried as, as Jesus destroying what, who we were, you know, and that we were bad people, and he had to come make all things new. We talked about all that. But now we know it, it, we were in just a measure of truth, but the truth was is he came to, re, to reveal the love of God and to destroy our perception of what he was doing. And that's a major difference there. So the passion was the eternal love of God, the love of God. Forgiveness did not suddenly become available because of the cross. You never, and this is hard for people, you never needed to be forgiven at all. And I talked about this earlier in this lesson. You can put for hyphen give. He forgave. He forgave. He gave it all to us before we were ever born of our mother. Before the foundation of the world, God gave everything. 
we have all things that pertain to life and godliness was before the foundation of the world. When we were born of our mother, we could have experienced that. It became a physical manifestation of that. And I believe if babies were taught from birth these truths, what a difference it would make in their life. What a difference it would make in our lives. So we think the good news, and here, here, here's really, this is the truth. This is where we've been at in the church. Anybody ever been to a testimony service? I call them telling your test and moaning about it for a while. Or telling about something great that's happened that you think was God. And so we get up and we think the good news is, oh, praise God, I got a raise this week. Or, oh, praise God, I received a healing. Or, praise God, I received a miracle. Right? And the list can go on and on and on. Praise God, I got the right husband. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you don't know yet. I <laughs> do. You do, maybe not Sandy. She knows, she knows. But am I not right? All my, and see, the word praise means to tell the story. Worship means ascertain, ascertain, seek, and desire to know, and praise means to tell the story. Well, we were worship, ascertaining, seeking, and desire to know the wrong things. We were after the hand of God, not the face of God. And so almost every testimony I've ever heard is about something that we, we thought we got. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, we moaning about the rest of it. <laughs> and on and on and on. No. The good news is that I had all this before the foundation of the world. The good news is I have life. I have abundance. I lack no thing whatsoever. And, and I, I coined a term a long time ago. And nobody really uses it, but I like it. But I live in a no-need realm. This, when you get up into the and wake up to the spirit realm, there is no need. You need nothing whatsoever. It's just there. It's just there. You know, uh, the other day I was driving home, my daughter Allison uh, got a nice table that was given to her four or five months ago, and she, so she had some old crabby old chairs that just wasn't working good. And sitting there on the road was six beautiful, solid wood, uh, winners only brand from Mathis Brothers dining room chairs. And it just so happened, it's the same kind of whitewash stain that's on her table. And they probably sell for about 250 a piece, so I just, I got them for her. And I brought them to her. She was so excited about them. But we were, I just talked to her a little bit about it. And I told her how I found that $100 bill the other day. And people were telling me how, uh, people ask me all the time, well, how do you find that stuff all the time? And I said, oh, I'm not always looking up for it to come from God. I just keep my eyes where God keeps my eyes focused. And I, I see things. And I've lived that, way, lived that way for a long time, haven't I, Donna? We have had more things show up in our life that we thought we needed. This. You can imagine that it didn't require any money whatsoever. It just required looking on the top of people's trash piles in the neighborhood, you know, or just anywhere or just, you know, I just believe. And I told my daughter, I said, it comes from uh, having eyes that expect provision instead of having eyes looking up for provision. Is that a good way of saying that? I, that my provision's already there. I don't have to look in the pantry to see if there's enough food for tomorrow. You, and when I say I, I mean all of us. I don't have to look at my checking account to see if I'm doing all right. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean you live stupidly, right? And you don't write checks when there's no money in there. <laughs> but you get to the place when you need to write a check, there's money there. Mm -hmm. That's where we want to be at, right? Yeah. When there's a requirement, then it's going to be there tomorrow. Then you take no thought. You don't. You consider the lilies of the field. It doesn't toss and twirl and, oh my gosh, am I going to have enough water or is there enough stuff in the ground? I mean, do you think a lily understands what's in the ground? What it's getting? No, it just draws. It just sits there and it just bees who it be. I don't understand how those chairs all of a sudden showed up for me. I don't understand how they sat there until noon and nobody else got them. I, I don't have to figure all that out. All I need to know is there it is. These people didn't want it. It's there. I'm getting it. I don't understand how the $100 bill showed up there. It's not like I needed that $100 bill, you know, and I never say thank God because I feel sorry for the person that lost it, you know? So I never say, oh, thank you, God. I needed that. No, I didn't need it, but it just happened to be there, you know? I hope I'm explaining this right to you. <laughs> But who you gave it to later on. Uh, yeah, who I gave it to later on needed it. 
You know, I gave it to a young lady on the cruise ship that was, uh, I could tell she was really, she was a very sweet young lady, very kind, but they don't make a lot of money and they're not at home very much. And so I gave it to her and I, she kept trying to get me to order a drink every night. I didn't want one, not that I wouldn't, but I didn't want one. And, but you know, she just kept coming over. Are you want tonight? You want to tonight? And so about the fourth night or whatever, I just, I said, well, I don't want to drink, but I want to bless you. And I gave it to her and she just put it in her pocket, you know, but then she came back a few minutes later with tears in her eyes and she didn't see what it was before. That's what's fun. <laughs> that, 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 see, I don't want it for me. I'm, I'm not trying to get a million dollars in the bank. You know, I want to be able to take care of my wife. I want to do what's wise, but I want, I want to bless people. That's what I'm here for. That's what you're here for. We're cherubim. We're people of blessing. We're here to bless people. And you'll never find happiness. I share this with people everywhere I go and tell them who they are. You'll never find happiness and stay, start becoming a cherubim. I mean, you see, remember those shows a long time ago how there was a real rich person and somebody was picked to give their wealth away for them. It was on TV a lot, you yeah. know. And don't you think that would be fun to do that? You know, he's a multimillionaire, and I'm going to choose you to share my wealth with people. You don't think that kind of flowed through you too? Changed your lifestyle? And see, God's got so much riches yeah. he wants to share with his people, and he wants to use us to do that. It's not always money. It's kind words. It's words of wisdom, words of encouragement, teaching, all kinds of things that's going to help people. And as it flows through you, it blesses you too. Amen? Amen. So... We want to understand, and I, we started this out by declaring Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning and for the ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. The things that are not yet done needs to be the things that were in the, in the, in the, before the beginning. In other words, what was true then, we need to be living out of those today. It's, it's available to us today. His counsel stands. He did all his pleasure before the foundation of the world. Everything that you've been praying and asking God to do, he already did it. He already did it. Amen. You know, I'm telling you guys today that this is this is our go out to eat Sunday. And we're going to go out to eat and I'm going to pull out a card and I'm going to pay for that. And you don't have to worry about it. And I'm going to cover the tip. How silly would it be for you after dinner is done? For you to say, Pastor, would you mind paying for my meal? <laughs> Wouldn't that be silly? Either you didn't listen with intelligence, <laughs> you know, you know, you what you was thinking about something else, you know, you we could do the whole list, and that's what's going on. We we didn't listen to the voice of spirit with intelligence, and we need to listen with intelligence. The word obey for you to understand means to listen with intelligence and to be able to repeat what was said. It doesn't mean I have to obey a bunch of rules. I need to listen with intelligence and to be able to repeat that which was said. And if I can do that, that's a wise person. Amen? Amen. So I pray what you heard today, you listen with intelligence. And when the temptation to fear comes, when the temptation to get out of your seat comes, when the temptation that says God's mad at you or this not, must not you, you need to be able to repeat what was said. And that's casting down vain imaginations. Okay. But how can you cast down a vain imagination if you don't know the truth? That's right. that's and casting right. down that's a vain right. imagination is not just quoting scripture. I used to do that and it didn't help at all. You can put it on your mirror. You can do everything. But you, when you know that you know. And so I say this. If somebody gets up and says, you're unholy. You're not righteous because you're not paying your tithe. You're not doing this. I could just quietly sit there and say, that's not true. I'm righteous and I'm holy. And I cast that down and I don't receive that mm -hmm. into myself. And what we've done is received a lot of stuff that's been taken away from us. We open our door. We don't, we don't say that Jesus has to come or the spirit has to come as a thief in the night. We just open our door and say, Father, I open myself up and anything that's hindering me, anything that's anti who you are, I willingly say, take it away. And how he does it is he teaches you the truth. The truth makes you free. Amen. So we need to seek the truth. God bless you. Thank you for being here. It's good to be back. As I, as I said earlier, we missed all you guys. We missed a lot of you on Facebook, but we had a good time uh, traveling around and 
want to do that a lot more. I was, when I get back, sometimes I really want to plan the next trip, <laughs> but we're not going to do that for a while. So I appreciate you. Bless you. Uh, those on the internet, we just love you so much. We always enjoy your comments. And, uh, as I say, your emails or whatever, keep them coming. If you haven't got it yet and you want a copy of the first volume of no penal substitution, there's a link on my Facebook page where you can order them. We send a lot of them out and I'm getting ready to order another, uh, another batch of them to come in. So, uh, for, we've enjoyed your comments about them. I'm working on volume two now. We will have that ready by mid 2018 or sooner. So God bless you. Appreciate you. Second time.